a link to, oh, there she's there. She's there. She made it. Okay. Got it. Never mind. All right. So we'll kick this off since we're recording. Hi, everyone. Hi, Michelle. Welcome. Um, so this is the Amherst Conservation Commission meeting on July 8th, starting at 7 p.m. Um, we have two items on our agenda tonight. Um, one is a Chapter 61A conversion and the other is a conservation restriction. Um, so Aaron, for the Chapter 61A, um, yes. so we need to provide a recommend, yeah, okay, sorry. That's okay. We need to provide a recommendation to the town council regarding right of first refusal for the land. Um, Correct. The Mitchell Family Farm Trust land on Sunderland Road. Yes. Um, I'm opening the materials. Do you have, I know you've been out there and been in touch. Do you have kind of a report and a summary that you can give us or did you wanna discuss anything in particular? Yeah, so there's a couple things. So we have the packet that is from um, the Mitchell Farm Trust um, attorney that was submitted to us that basically explains the situation. Um, their, their property has been in 60, Chapter 61A, and they, so it's been in agricultural use. Um, For how long? Um, if you don't know, I, don't, that's us. I'm okay. not positive of how long, but I know it's a, um, uh, Amherst family. So, you know, it's, it, um, it's been in for some time. Um, they have a bona fide purchase offer, I believe, um, for a non-agricultural use. So they're requesting to basically, um, convert the land from an agricultural use to a non-agricultural use. Um, so typically, um, our role in looking at that is to take a look at what the resources are on the land and see if we feel that the um, see if we feel that the resources warrant us to recommend acquisition of the property. And I'm, I apologize for whatever reason I can. Um, screens are a little funky here. Um, so just to, to share with you the, the parcels, and I can't see attendees um, from the public if anybody's in attendance and has questions. So hopefully, um, Jen, you can kind of keep an eye on that, um, but I'll just, because I'm sharing my screen, but this is the, the property. It's located between Montague Road Route 63 and Sunderland Road, and Eastman Brook, which is a perennial stream, runs through it, comes down, and then circles back north again. Um, it's mapped as perennial on a USGS. There's wetlands mapped on the property. There's flood zone on the property, um, existing um, FEMA, flood, FEMA designated flood zone, as well as in our the town's um, flood map revisions, which are currently underway. It's showing 100 year flood zone on the property. We've looked at this property many times in the last year, haven't we? Um, because of wetlands the, issue? In the last year? Um, yes. So there was there was actually a an ANRAD for a property just north of here that we had a peer review on. Um, Isn't this the one we had to do all the wetlands review about where things were? No, Larry, that Maybe was the one across the street. That's across the street. Okay, I thought that was the same property. Sorry about that. There was one across the street, and there was also one north of here as okay. well. So yeah. you're, I did the same thing. I was like, hey, I recognize this area, yeah, but that's what I thought it they was. are the different parcels. Okay. Yep. Um, so there's flood zone, and then... Um, this shows, um, this is a map of prime forest, or I'm sorry, prime um, agricultural soils. Um, so you can see where the ag soils are located, the prime agricultural soils are located on the property. And then I also did a, um, I 
Sorry, I've got a very upset baby upstairs. It's blustering me. <laughs> um, uh, this is a customized soil report from USGS on the property as well. Um, so you can see the, the property is kind of highlighted here and then it goes into the different um, soil types that are located on the property. And I provided this to you. I don't, ex you know, I didn't want to kind of go through this with a fine tooth comb during the meeting, more so just to alert you to the fact these are kind of the, the general things that we would look at um, in determining our recommendation to town council as to whether or not we feel that the property should be acquired. And um, one other sort of last minute thing is that we did receive um, letter, uh, an email from, and I put it in the wrong folder, I think, a letter from an abutter who, um, this was literally this evening, like right at the end of the end of the afternoon. I didn't get, even get a chance to read it, um, but they're basically, there, there are butters who live nearby on Pulpit Hill Road and um, kind of pointing out important considerations about the property for us to be aware of. And then there's also a report that they provided to us on the back, property, back, which includes- Can you let photos. us read that? Can you let us read of that? Of course, yep. I'm sorry about that. I'll toggle Larry, back. It's in, the, it's in the file if you have access yeah, to it. Yeah, Larry, it might be better to just open it on your computer so we can all read. Yeah. You mean I've got to move to a different computer? <laughs> That's no. okay. Don't worry. Don't Sorry. Worry. Make the window smaller. Yeah. So I'll just I'll just stick here for a second so you guys can, I mean, however, whatever you guys want to do. Um, this ahead. is the Go letter, ahead. the email that was just received. And then there's a report that was received or a document that was received with, with photos as well. It's, and there, so basically there's you know they're they're highlighting sort of the same a lot of the same information that um you know I highlighted in my report as far as you know the flood zone Eastman Brook being a perennial stream where the property is located um I don't know why this flips so quickly it's sorry about that um and then so there, what she's talking about the eruptor. So there's this um, project that's been presented to town staff and it's, um, they have a website. It's, I think it's pretty well public knowledge at this point that they've talked about um, putting in a research lab um, called the eruptor lab. And it's a large sort of research and development um, uh, project. And from what I understand, this is what they are hoping to construct and there's a website eruptor the eruptor website where they kind of go over a lot of these renderings and things so they're yeah. proposing to sell the property to a, a a group that will develop this eruptor property correct but as a reminder our job isn't to assess you know what they do with the property our job is to make is to advise town council if based on the resources on the property we should execute our right to purchase the property. I agree with that. However, in the process, I assume that if the town exercises its right to take the property, they take it at the full market value. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. That's 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 the critical part. Is it is that the full market value or the appraised value? Uh, I'm not sure which one it is. I'm sure it's uh, that would also probably end up in court, but uh, I'm sure it's at least initially in terms of the town looking at it, it'll be the fair, it'll be whatever the fair market value it's, is. It's, it's whatever is described in the purchase and sale agreement. It's a language that's articulated in the PNS, which should say what the what what the what the price should be calculated based on. And, and that's so, probably that's probably above the fair market value. So Laura, that's the PNS with the eruptor people. Uh, so. so have, I don't know what this particular purchase and sale agreement says. I just know that anytime I've executed on a purchase option or a rover, it, in that rover it says how the price will be calculated. So I don't, okay. I don't have that language in front of me right now. But okay. again, I also don't think that's really our purview, is it? I mean, right. no, 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 no. I just, exactly. I just want to jump. 
um, just to sort of address that, from from what I understand, there's there there's an offer to purchase the property currently, and from what I understand, if the town decided to exercise its right of first refusal, there would be appraisals that were done on behalf by the town. The town would have an appraisal of the property, and then the landowner could have an appraisal of the property, and they could use those to negotiate if they decided to proceed. But again, that that is all contingent on the you know town council deciding to move forward with um, trying to purchase it. So right now what the town council is looking for from us as well as from the planning board is um, recommendations on whether to exercise the right of first refusal, whether they should look into purchasing this land. And whether, or, we, think, whether we think Larry, the property is appropriate Larry. value for the town in terms of conservation level. All right. so it sounds like valuation is the, kind of the next step. We're right? just at the first step, which is whether or not we'd be interested in the land at all, which conservation value. Okay, hold on. Let's let's maybe do hand raising because this you. is where I think um, people are are accidentally interrupting. So let's use the raise hand tool just because not everyone has video, me mostly. Um, but yes. Yeah. So it sounds like, to Laura's point, um, the valuation is something that would happen and appraisal is something that would happen next. And I think, Leroy, thank you for advancing the conversation. We need to think about the resources on the site. So Anna, did you want to add? That? Yeah, so, so I, I, thing one is with the law states is fair, full and fair market value. So just to kind of check that box. Um, two, I think that one of my questions that I had about the email that came in is, you know, regardless, so if we choose not to exercise our right, like that email was hugely helpful. I saw the author of it is in our attendees. So thank you for that. Um, but I, I think my question is they, I mean, they, they're still going to have to come through the process, right? We are, we're absolutely not ignoring these resources. It's more of a matter of, we are currently deciding whether or not we think the town needs to permanently conserve um, these resources by purchasing the land. Um, so just to just to make sure that's really clear that we're not yep. allowing uh, things to be built in wetlands in in denying right. in not recommending this. Great. If we choose that route. And if I could just state, um, Dave Zomek asked me to state for the record that this. So let's. Aaron, sorry, I'm not sure how to raise my hand on here. I apologize. Um, right along the bottom, there's a raise hand, but it's okay, Aaron. <laughs> you don't have to use the raise hand. Um, Just yeah, go it ahead. doesn't show up on my screen because I have I'm sharing my from my uh, screen. But, um, okay, okay, yeah, yeah. Um, but I will I will try to figure it out here. Um, uh, I wanted to just state for the record that Dave Zomek asked me to mention that this property was not highlighted in the um, open space and recreation plan as a location in town that is priority for conservation land acquisitions. Um, apparently this area is specifically zoned for research and development. And so um, that was basically what he wanted me to just state for the record. Thanks, Aaron. I remember him making that point in the past. Michelle, did you have a comment or questions? Yeah, please. Um, Aaron, do you mind scrolling back up to the bulleted listed points? I saw something about this being in the context of natural heritage priority lands, which I didn't see specifically on the property, but I'm wondering about its context in the greater landscape and if that's something to think about. <sighs> Yeah, I was wondering a similar thing in terms of connectivity of like the stream network with Eastbrook. I mean, again, to Anna's point, if this land were to be pulled out of 61A and sold to this company to put this facility on the site, they still have to go through our full NOI permit process and still can make sure that we can do our job to protect the wetland. And part right. of that process is a complete understanding of natural heritage mapping and a complete understanding of FEMA mapping. It'd be very unusual that we would allow any kind of development at all in the 100-year floodplain, for example. Ideally, they wouldn't want to do that. Um, just as a little bit of background, um, 
we, this is, you know, a slightly different decision than our general permitting process, which is, you know, being faced with a project and making a decision about how to protect the resources at that juncture. Um, but I'm, I'm with you, Michelle, I, I worry, you know, Eastman Brook is a, is a really cool stream system um, for like aquatic ecology and connectivity. Um, so it's definitely a valued resource worth protecting. So I'm just, just to that question, pulling up mm -hmm. um, natural heritage and endangered species layers that we would ordinarily review in the course of our um, wetlands filings. So that's estimated habitat and priority habitat. Um, there are also um, other like biomap core habitat, critical habitat. I'm not sure what the um, person who wrote the letter was ref was referring to as far as natural heritage endangered species because I didn't see anything on the property from um, that fell under natural heritage um, designation. So but maybe this is a good moment. I see Janet is here. Um, thank you for joining us, Janet. I think that's the person who wrote the letter if I'm not mistaken. Um, if you have any clarifications or comments or input or want to say anything Janet, at this point, just raise your hand and we can give you the ability to talk. Great. Um, so you should be able to contribute at this point, Janet, and we appreciate you um, making that to be here and writing that letter better. Thank you. Um, so go ahead if you have anything to add. <laughs> sure. So I, um, I thank you for this discussion um, and appreciate it very much. I can um, uh, hear the um, expertise that you have and um, have seen before and am grateful to see again um, your concern for the resources and um, uh, if you, uh, I'm not sure uh, how exactly I worded that um, about the, the uh, presence of the natural resources, but um, I yield to your superior um, uh, understanding on that. If I got it wrong, um, uh, if there aren't any present on the land. Um, thanks, I, I thought I was saying potentially, but uh, if I got that wrong, um, I stand corrected, thank you. No, no problem. Thank you for attending, Janet, um, and point taken. Um, so unless you have, um, are any of the other attendees here? Um, I see a Hilda Bound. Um, oh, Hilda has her hand raised. We'll bring you in. Um, you should be up. Oh, there we go. Hilda, if you wanted to make any comments yeah, or ask any I'm questions. Yeah, I'm Hilda Greenbaum, and I'm a, on a butter to on a butter at 298 Montague Road. And I would see this project uh, if it's built where they say they want to put it. Um, I guess the, the building what they've been telling us is, is on the eastern end of the parcel, but it abuts the 400 feet of residential zone land. So they know they have to bring utilities and, and, and the road and everything from Sunderland Road. My issue is not specific to this parcel at this point, but I would like to know what the current regulations are with regard to how much wetland can be displaced and replaced. Because when, when other projects have come before uh, Conservation Commission, there was more than 5,000 square feet, so they weren't viable. And if you look at the town map, you'll see just at the south of my house, part of a huge subdivision that was denied because it was too wet back there. More than 5,000 feet would have been 
needed to be replicated. So what what is the what is the general rule nowadays about the number of square feet that can be disturbed and rep replicated? Is there a maximum, Erin? Um, so if it's over 500 square feet, then they're required to replicate. And um, there are only very specific parameters under which um, wetland can be altered and replicated. Um, so it would have to meet all of those requirements. One of them being that the wetland is a finger-like projection off of an existing wetland. So it's not like you can come in and fill in a whole wetland. It, you can only fill in, um, I, I mean, and again, <laughs> it's not like we can just say, oh yeah, you know, fill in the wetland. There, there, there's a very specific set of um, performance standards that the applicant would have to meet. Um, I think that it's a little bit jumping the gun on- It is, that's why I wasn't being specific. I'm yeah. asking you in general. Yeah, but I believe the regulations is up to 5,000 square feet um, under certain, again, under certain parameters. And then a replication would have to also meet certain parameters being in the same general area as the area that's filled. Um, it, it has to have certain hydrologic and soil characteristics in order to, you know, be able to even, for the commission to even consider that. Um, so. Thank you. Great, thanks. Thanks, Erin. Thanks, Hilda. Um, so I'm going to, let's see. Um, so, okay. Janet, um, did you still have a question? Your hand is still raised or are you all set? No more hands, okay. <laughs> um, all right. So I think at this point, um, we have a good understanding of public interests here um, and the resources on the site and the question being presented. So um, before we do kind of a back on how everyone's doing uh, on this, I just wanted Aaron to see if you had any guidance um, to share on this decision. I'm sorry, could you say that one more time, Jen? You broke up a little bit. Sorry, I was just going to say before we kind of do a straw man poll and see how everyone's feeling or if there's more we need to know, I wanted to see if you had any specific guidance on this. Did I lose I mean, you you're, again? You're, ask, you're asking a farm girl, so I feel like I'm going to have to... Um, okay, okay. I'm going to have to kind of not offer a an official recommendation. I grew up on a farm in Amherst. My farm was permanently protected. <laughs> So I'm biased, extremely biased, and um, I'm going to be straight up with you about that. So, okay, fair enough. Thank you. Does anyone, so let's kind of move around the quote unquote room. Um, and you're going in and out. You, you cut out sometimes. I don't know. That's if it's based just me. on the town level open spacing. You're breaking Sorry. up, Jen. Hey, Jen, you're break, you're breaking up a lot. Sorry, so, you're. So ahead. I'm just gonna jump. I'm just gonna jump in here, Jen. Since you're having issues, do you mind if if Leroy just takes the poll kind of through, just so that we can make sure that. Um, uh, yeah, can everybody hear me? Okay. Jen, too. That sounds great. Go ahead. All right. Excellent. <laughs> uh, then I'll just go in the order I see you guys. Uh, Larry, first. How are you feeling about this? I don't think the town should take, uh, go after the property. Fair enough, Laura. Um, while it has not been addressed or indicated through the broader town plan, you know, I still think that Amherst should consider, um, uh, you know, acting upon that right of first refusal given what I've read um, and potentially the, the species that exist. So I actually, I do think we should um, recommend that the town purchase the property. All right, for her first meeting, it's, uh, it's already interesting. Michelle, your thoughts? Um, I guess I, I second Laura, not having a lot of context in this, but it does seem like there's some conservation values on the property that should be 
at least looked into further. Anna? Um, all right, so I'm looking at, I'm gonna make it complicated or maybe I'm just gonna ask more questions. Uh, Aaron, I'm looking at the, the open space um, interest plan or the open space plan, mm -hmm. there we go. open space and recreation plan. Um, and I'm, I'm kind of just curious in terms of your thoughts, you know, I know Dave said this doesn't really fit in with the, the plan, or it, this isn't necessarily a major component of that, um, that long-term conservation plan. But he, had a, he, had a, he had a conflict in that. He said, because it's already dedicated to a, a development thing. That, Larry, I was not, uh, Larry, I was not done talking. Um, I know. Me one moment, please. So, so my question for you, Aaron, is, you know, do you, I understand that this is not necessarily, there's two parts to this, right? Like it's not, well, it's not in that long, long range vision. Um, there is a part of this, which is kind of the original question of, of conservation resource. Um, I'm leaning towards saying no to exercising the right, um, because I don't feel like given the overlay of species, there was, uh, in my mind, kind of enough to, to justify that given the cost. And so my, I'm asking 17 rambling questions. My other question is, are we factoring in what the market value of this land is when we look at it? Um, in, with regard, no, Laura's shaking her head, cool. Yeah, I don't think we are at this point. This question is simply, are we interested in the resources and the right to first refusal? I mean, I'm then always look interested. At evaluation, look at what's there, et cetera. Yeah. And I mean, just to, just to very quickly touch on what you said, Anna, um, I think that the town in the open space and recreation plan targets by priority lands it hopes to acquire in specific areas and the reason for that being like resource area or habitat connectivity for example so like if there was a like zala is a great example it was between podic and catherine cole that's like yeah that's prime area that we hoped to mm -hmm. acquire and we did acquire mm -hmm. um i think like hickory ridge is another good example of like a resource along Fort River that is natural heritage endangered species. Um, it contains significant intermittent streams and perennial streams coming into the Fort River and so on and so forth. So it's like we have certain pro properties that are targeted in those plans and then um, while multiple departments sort of contribute to the open space and recreation plan, the idea is also highlighting priority areas and maybe not so priority areas for, for conservation and recreation purposes. So that's, that's basically the context of that comment. Thank you. Yeah, I'm leaning towards no. And Larry, say your hand up, we'll get to you because we're almost over the poll because last up is Jen. What are we thinking? <clears throat> All right, next to last up. I'm, I'm still on the list. Uh, I, I think this is going to end up being a no. But I'm actually with Laura that I really believe that this initial step is simply would we be interested in seeing what's there? Why I think it'll end up being a no is I think we'll end up being able to protect it through the law and our bylaws quite significantly anyway without the cost. Right. But uh, I'm always interested and if we have the right, we should at least look into it. We, worst we can do is say no later on. That's the way I see it. And now, Jen, if we're hearing from you at all, are you still there? Can you guys hear me? Yep. Yes. You. Okay. Sorry. I'm so sorry about that. But I think I caught most of You're everyone's good. input. Um, and, you know, I agree with, I think, Leroy and others that if there's a shot at at least further evaluation and understanding the landscape better, I think we should, I mean, the landscape in terms of purchasing the property, I think that we should advise town council that they look into the rate of first refusal. Um, and that's based on, you know, my understanding of the hydro hydrologic and like water resources on the site. So um, I believe what we're, oh, and get Anna and Larry before. I'm yielding to others, oh. yep. Uh, so I guess my question is, what's the downside of recommending, right? Like, because I, I definitely am hearing what Leroy and Jen are saying. Um, 
is there any re like why would we not i mean every area that's going to come out of chapter 61 is probably going to have something right so I, i'm curious where that line is where we wouldn't recommend or where we would because i mean yeah i i agree like if there is a chance if it is if we are able to then of course that'd be great but that i guess my question is like when would we not if that's the if that's the way we're looking at it Okay. Um, yeah, go ahead, Larry. Larry, I think has his two, 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 two things. One is that, that one of the things that I think we've got to realize is that we have to, re people, people are going to respect us if we give them a good choice. So we've got to have good reasons for doing what we're going to do. Otherwise, they'll say, oh, ignore the Conservation Commission. That's one thing. The second is that I was starting to say before is, remember, it will come back to us anyway because we will have control over how they develop the conservation side of that property so we can have an impact in the end. That's my two points. Right, but so to Anna's question, you know, I don't know how, quite how to answer that. I, we haven't faced many chapter 61A conversions like in my tenure on the commission, um, but I see your, what you're saying, like if something is in 61A, for agriculture, when would we not? I mean, I think there's a possibility that it's like a point where the, the soil and water resources on the site is so degraded that, you know, it's something where you'd have to restore the resources in order to have them be a functional part of the ecosystem. You know, I can imagine mm -hmm. scenarios where there just aren't quite the patchwork of water resources on the site. Um, yeah. 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 So I, I could see this being a, a spectrum and this being more towards an, a, a property that has resources, that, you know, resources of important conservation value. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah and, and looking at it that way, then, I mean, it makes sense for me based on, uh, is it Eastman? Yeah. Based on the way Eastman runs through it, then yes, that's a resource that we'd want to protect. And so that, yeah, that would make sense to me to, to encourage council to at least look at it and consider. Right. I just wanted to note too, for the record, that there was a comment in the question and answer that Hilda Greenbaum um, stated that the purchase price for 18 plus acres is 1.6 million. Yeah. That's yeah, that not really relative that. to us. No, just, just stating yeah. it for the record that it was stated yeah. in the comments. And it was in their letter or in the um, packet. Yeah. All right. Um, well, should we, I, I, I think we should probably vote on this. You need a motion. Um, yeah. So I, um, wait a minute. We don't need a motion yet. We need to vote. Well, a mo vote, vote on what? I mean, you, you have to know what you're going to vote on. Right. So um, let me pull up the agenda. Hang on and I'll read it exactly. <sighs> Um, here we go. Okay, so I need a vote on whether or not the we want to recommend that the town council exercise the right of first refusal on um, the property of Thomas F. Mitchell Family Trust and Mitchell Family Farm Trust land on Sunderland Road. Um, so we'll go around. I need a voice yeah. vote here. Wait, somebody needs to no, make no, a motion. Oh. I, I got it. I got it. All right. Uh, I move we recommend town council exercise its right of first refusal on the parcel of on the Mitchell family parcel at uh, I can't see the address of the Mitchell family parcel in North Amherst. Could I just a clarifying point was the was the motion to exercise the first right of first refusal? I'm sorry to to uh, to consider. Yes, it was yes. Amazing. Advise that town council exer exercise yes. the right of first refusal. Yes. Correct. Sorry, I've got to write this verbatim. So, oh gosh, I don't even remember what I said already. <laughs> it's good. Yeah. We need a second. So, second. I think Laura's got the second on that one. Fine. <laughs> and then we'll do a voice vote. Anna. Aye. Larry. No. Leroy. Aye. Laura. Aye. Michelle. Aye. And I'm an I.
Got that, Aaron? So Larry's the only no. I just want to make sure I got that right. Yeah. Yes, correct. Okay. Sorry, Larry. <laughs> okay. Very good. All right. So we're taking a little longer than expected. Sorry, everyone. Sorry about my internet issues here. But the net, the second and last item on the agenda is to review and consider approval of the drafted conservation restriction pro proposed for 95 Old Bench Belchertown Road. And Stephanie, I'm sorry um, for the delay here. Thank you for hanging with us. Um, do you want to kind of orient us to the property um, and the conservation restriction, a big overview, a, a quick overview? I'll try to make it a quick overview and, and no worries. Um about the delay, that was fine. Um, I'll share my screen and just show you a map of the of the property. Perfect. Just bear with me one second. Okay, are you seeing that? Yes. No. Okay, great. Um, so this, uh, this project has an incredibly long history. The town um, had entered into a power purchase agreement uh, with Sun Edison, actually initially with Blue Wave Solar to develop the South Landfill parcel, this particular parcel um, back in 2011. And um, for many reasons, the project ended up not moving forward. And so, uh, fast forward years later, the town um, entered into an agreement with Sun Edison to develop the North landfill and the South landfill for solar. And upon um, meetings with Natural Heritage and Endangered Species Program, it was identified that the grasshopper sparrow was in both locations, which is a, an endangered species. We knew about the South landfill. We didn't know about the North landfill. So um, it proposed uh, a bit of a dilemma as to how to move forward. And in a meeting with Natural Heritage, we came up with the idea that if we could maximize development on the North landfill, then we could put a conservation restriction on the South landfill to um, maintain grasshopper sparrow habitat in perpetuity. So that is the proposal that's before you now. The town has worked with the Kestrel Land Trust uh, for quite some time in developing a, on the CR draft that's before you. This is still a draft. There may be some final edits. I just wanted to say that right up front. The final edits will be very minor. Um, so if you choose to approve it this evening, um, you will get a final version. This may not be it, but it'll be very minor adjustments. So the map that you're looking at now um, currently, uh, there's no fence or anything around the landfill. If you, for those of you who have been to it, it very much has been treated as a as a recreational space by the town. A lot of people use it to walk their dogs. Uh, people have access over the cap, um, so it's a little bit unusual in that most landfills are um, are not treated as recreational spaces. Um, but this one has a very natural aesthetic to it, so. I know you're familiar with the dog park that's come before you. So the um, the dog park that's identified has already gone through approval uh, and will be uh, constructed this summer. Um, actually, and I believe it's supposed to be having been under construction now, it's the beginning of it. So the rest of the area is proposed to be fenced off. If you look, um, this, this fence line, uh, this fence line around the is basically around the cap. The interior of that entire space would be maintained for grasshopper sparrow habitat. So the only access would be for staff that needs to come in to mow and that's actually part of the habitat management plan. So there would be access for mowing. The mowing would be restricted to um, outside of nesting season. Um, should there need to be access for the DPW uh, for um, reasons of maintenance of the actual landfill itself, uh, they would be allowed to do so. The CR does recognize that this is in fact a landfill uh, first and foremost. Um, 
but anything that the town or the DPW would do to the landfill has to restore it back to this somewhat natural, more natural looking state. So um, there is that consideration taken into account. It's quite unusual <laughs> to have a CR on a landfill as we've discovered uh, in our process. So this may be the only one in the entire state and possibly even the country we've, we've inquired uh, to others if they've had CRs um, on landfills and we haven't had any other examples. So, so we would actually set some kind of a precedent, I believe, with this project. So um, the idea was to maintain the recreational value by putting in a perimeter trail that will go around so that people can still walk their dogs. I mean, we do have the dog park. So now um, it sort of formalizes people's ability to walk their animals around the property. It will be fenced. It has to be fenced to protect the grassland birds and to keep dogs out. So um, there will be restricted access. People won't be able to use the top of the landfill anymore, but they can walk around the perimeter. And it isn't identified here, but just for those of you who may have knowledge, there is a, a sledding hill area in this section of the of the property that people have used over the years and that will still be available so people can still use that as a sledding hill. Um, we are proposing to put in a viewing platform um, as well with a with a kiosk to sort of identify um, information about the about the grasshopper sparrow. Uh, there may be additional uh, kiosks but those haven't been identified at least at this point but it is built into the CR to allow for that opportunity to have more signage at some point. Uh, but there is a limit as to the, the number, not specifically the number, but more the, the total um, square footage of impact is written to the CR. So for the, for the most part, this is a pretty straightforward CR. It's really just protecting the habitat and resource values of the property. Um, but what's specific to this is that it is allowing the town to access the site as it needs to in terms of operating the, uh, the landfill and maintaining the landfill. But everything that's done to the landfill cap in terms of maintenance is in accordance with being in line with the um, respectful of the breeding season and the, and the habitat. So that's pretty much it, does anyone have any questions? I do. I do. Okay, hey, go ahead, Larry. Why, what, what is, what's the, what's the reason that the town is granting this to the Kestrel land trust? Well, what, what, why is the, why is this going the way it is? Why doesn't the town just do it itself? Well, the Kestrel land trust has, we have to have a holder of the CR, which is not, the town we, itself. We so well, we can't hold it. No, no, no we cannot. Okay, that, so, that, that answers so, my question. Yeah, and that and that was really actually, um, honestly, if Kestrel Land Trust <laughs> didn't agree or uh, to partner with us in this project, it would have been a bit of a challenge because uh, getting you someone. My to, question. That's all. It, that's all it took was to say that we had to have somebody else. That's sure, fine. but I just want to point out again yeah. the the unique situation that we have, and that this is a landfill. So, to be the holder yeah. of a CR in a landfill is really not typical. It's very unusual. So we were lucky in that they were willing to do this and partner with us. I used to use that landfill. <laughs> anyway, it's another issue. Um, I think Mich Michelle has a, a hand raised. Michelle, do you want to go ahead? Yeah, thanks. Um, I just had some questions about the conservation restrictions, and I didn't wasn't able to see the habitat management plan. And I know that it's incorporated into the restrictions, but mm -hmm. um, there was a lot of uh, things that you said that weren't included in the easement, the conservation easement, and I just specifically about the trails, like there wasn't a lot of specific um, restrictions on like linear feet. There was definitely the type of trails and the width of trails, but there was nothing really saying. It, it was granting the ability of the town to create trails as they saw fit, but I didn't see anything about ultimately restricting trails through the grassland habitat. So I was wondering maybe if we could look at the, or be sent the actual habitat management plan Sure, but yeah, there is no there is no access to the um, within the the management area. 
pub, there's no public access. As I said, staff can, and yes, we can send that to you for sure. Um, but there is no access allowed to the public into this uh, man wildlife management area. So just to clarify, the maximum trail would literally be the perimeter. It's the perimeter trail. trail is yeah. the, that is the trail. That is the specific trail that is outlined and identified for this project. There is no trails will be allowed within this location. And so that restriction itself is incorporated by reference into the conservation easement. Is that the idea? Because it's not yes. actually in the conservation easement that that's the specific restriction. Yes. Okay. Just wondering about that. Um, yeah, there was definitely some language that needed to be corrected in the upfront um, introduction of the conservation easement just regarding, it said something about like early successional grassland habitat and that was a little strange. Um, but I guess someone's going to be reviewing that more thoroughly. Um, in the in the CR, yeah. Michelle? Yeah. Um, if you wanted to send, if you wanted to follow up with me outside of the meeting regarding some of that language, we'd be happy to have your input. Sure, I can do that. Thanks, Michelle. Um, okay, so Aaron, given that there's likely to be like some final tweaking and editing of the CR itself, what is our goal here? <laughs> I mean, um I would recommend that the um, Conservation Commission make a recommendation to proceed with finalizing the language in the conservation restriction um, that's been drafted between the town and Kestrel Land Trust. Okay. Um, does, thank you for clarifying that. Uh, before we move to a motion, does anyone else have any questions or comments on this? To me, it seems very well thought out. Um, go ahead, Anna. Uh, Stephanie, I'm curious if you've received any concern from abutters um, about the newest part of this or kind of newest part of this moving forward. And so what we've like sentiment has been. Sure. So, I mean, as you know, this has a very long history and we did outreach actually went out into the neighborhood um, when we had this latest uh, proposal uh, because originally when this came to us the idea was to develop both parcels as I said um, so over time that changed and when we got to the point where we were discussing this particular scenario of putting the CR on this portion of the of the project area um, we did go around to the neighborhood um, we did flyer both the North landfill site and the and the South landfill site and it was mixed there were people that were in support. There were people who don't want a fence, um, but there, this project has gone through lo the local permitting process. It, it actually has been before you all for the North landfill for development of the solar. Mm -hmm. um, it's also gone before the, uh, the ZBA as well. So there were abutters there who were uh, in opposition, some of them because they were just in opposition to solar in general in terms of potential health impacts. And then there were people who were concerned about the installation of a fence around the perimeter and the height of the fence. Um, originally, the fence was proposed to be six feet. There was a request by an abutter to uh, make the fence four feet. And in the end, the agreed upon height was five feet, <laughs> which was to be consistent with the, um, the dog <laughs> fence, dog park fence. So. So that's, you know, as I say, the, you know, the concerns have been both pro and against, but the majority, for the most part, what we've heard is more uh, people in favor. People were definitely in favor of this being protected versus being developed as solar. Thank you. That's great. Michelle, is that another question? I would just like to make one comment. There's a... Um a park in Berkeley, California, that's on a landfill and it's dog walking, people viewing, bird nesting, endangered species. It's called Cesar Chavez Park. I don't know if they have a easement on it, but um, if you're looking for some kind of similar precedent or something, maybe that's of use. But otherwise, it's too bad that we can't go birding on top of the landfill anymore. Well, that's <laughs> what I'm the in viewing. Completely support of the restrictions on it. 
I was going to say that's partly what the viewing platform is is proposed as is to at least have some ability to view from from a, a, a height. It's not exactly the same, but it, it was um, the idea was to at least still make it somewhat accessible to folks. To me, it sounds like we're in good company then. <laughs> that's great about the other site in, Ber in Berkeley, Michelle. Um, yeah, and Stephanie, I think this is really, frankly, cool, and I appreciate how much, like, out-of-the-box thinking and compromising and navigating um, this has probably taken to get to this point, so thank you. Um, yeah, good job. I'm for that. Sorry. Yeah. I, so, I will breathe when we actually have the site, the North Landfill site under construction. <laughs> fair enough, fair enough. Um, okay, so with that, I need a motion um, to approve the drafted conservation restriction proposed for 95 Old Belchertown Road. I'll make the motion okay. to approve <laughs> the drafted conservation uh, restriction for 95 Belchertown, um, Belchertown Road. Second. All right, voice vote. Um, Michelle. Yay. Hi. Sorry. <laughs> I like yay better. <laughs> uh, Leroy. Uh, Anna. Hi. Larry. Hi. Laura. Hi. And I'm an I, so that's all eyes across the board. Aaron. Excellent. And that concludes our agenda for tonight. Unless Aaron, you had anything else? I think that's it. I do not. Thank um, you guys so, for taking the time to schedule this special meeting. Yep. Thanks, everyone. And I guess I need a motion to adjourn. I move we adjourn. How about, how, about a motion, how about a motion to fix your video camera? <laughs> it, it works, Larry, but I, don't, I think it would derail the whole meeting. So. All right. Sorry, and we adjourn at 7.57 p.m. <laughs> Thank you all so much. Larry, you seem to be acting up more now that uh, Brent's not the, not the chair. What's going on here? I know. Geez, what are I, you I mean, doing, Larry? What, what, can we stop the recording for a second, please? What, what's going on? <laughs> Is there a vote on the... Wait, yeah, we got to vote uh, to adjourn. Yeah, yeah. Let's, oh. let's vote. Voice vote. Michelle. Aye. Aye. Leroy. Aye. Anna. Aye. Larry. Aye. Aye. Laura. Aye. And I'm an aye but I support this post-recording line of questions. <laughs> <laughs> I moved location tonight. I'm, at, I'm out on my living room rather than my desk. So that's you're, just you're, like you're, a more aggressive you're, chair. You're dodging. I'm, 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 I'm just 